Well, hello everyone. How are you here today? I'm Sue from Sewing and Slippers with Sue, and I'm so pleased to be here with another Sue. Sue, do you go by Sue or Susan? Usually Susan. Okay, good. I go by Sue in my business, Susan at home with my family, so that works out perfectly. Nice. Hey, it is so nice to finally meet you. We've been chatting back and forth because we both run an interesting quilting business. So I, I would love to hear about Stitched by Susan. Tell us how you got into the quilting world. Well, I mean, it is a bit of a story and I think I came in in a kind of unusual fashion. Um, I grew up in a quilting family. My mother, my grandmother, my great grandmother, et cetera, were all quilters. But oh, wow. learning to quilt Sorry. with my mom was a different story. In my childhood, we lived without electricity for a number of years. We were very much pioneers in central British Columbia, Canada. And so I learned to sew on a treadle sewing machine. And we oh, were goodness. completely unaware of the big wide world of quilting, meaning <laughs> rotary colors and mats and squaring up and fabric designers and all of that. We quilted in, you know, much like our pioneering of plowing the land, we were pioneers of quilting too. We used the fabrics that we had, scissors and ballpoint pens, etc. So that's how I grew up quilting. And then, you know, went on to have children and life and things. So I was in my forties before I started getting into quilting again. And by this time I was living in Spokane, Washington, where I am now. Oh, and attended where you are. Ev yeah. Attended my first ever quilting class of any description. And it was one on machine quilting at the domestic machine because I realized I wanted to get back into quilting. I no longer knew anybody that quilted by hand and to do that by yourself while lovely is very time consuming. And I couldn't make enough quilts. I'm a way. hand quilter as well. I, I get that. I used to be, I'm not anymore. <laughs> yes. So, you know, I still do it, but it's more for pleasure and embellishment now as opposed yeah. to utilitarian, you know, trying to turn out whole quilts. And so that's when I, my eyes were kind of open. I attended my first ever quilt show and began to, you know, dive into the addiction that is quilting. <laughs> um, we all get it. <laughs> yeah. Just learning about fabric designers. It was like a candy store to me to mm. find out all of the things that were available. My mom was very much a calico prince, you know, 80s and 90s type of florals. And I had inherited those from her. She had passed away by this time. And that was all I knew. So finding people like Allison Glass and um, Tula Pink was just <laughs> a eye for me, as you can imagine, right? Yeah, so much fun. So, yeah. So my mom and I ran a quilt shop back in the 80s. So I know that calico scene that you're talking about. And that's yeah. where, seems like that's where we all started back in the 70s and 80s. And I started quilting back in the 70s. So I totally get where you're coming from. But boy, what a transformation from your pioneer days on a treadle sewing machine. Um, what a unique experience at that time to have lived that way. And I loved your podcast, your first podcast, where you talked with your sister about that experience. So that's a podcast that I'm definitely gonna recommend to my students and customers that are listening, because I want them to find out all about you and what you're currently doing. Um, our audience here are quilters who love applique. And many of those quilters are starting to machine quilt their own quilts mostly on a domestic machine, but some of them are getting into long arms too. So I thought I'd love to have you here to talk to us about machine quilting your quilt and your business. I just love For what sure. you're doing. For sure. Well, kind of where I left off in the last story is where this one picks up, I guess. Um, you know, I had taken this first class on how to machine quilt and that wasn't my domestic machine. And so I started out that way and quite enjoyed it. And I'm not sorry that that's the way I began because it's so, you're so close to it, right? And you are in control of everything. So some sewing machines now have stitch regulators, but then they didn't. So you're entirely in control, the speed, the stitch length, and obviously the shape of your designs. So it's not a bad way to start. Um, it's a bit like learning to drive a standard vehicle, a stick shift vehicle. Right? <laughs> I think everybody yeah, should do that. <laughs> same time. So, you know, there's advantages too to starting with some of the uh, aids that machines come with now, rulers or a built-in stitch regulator that yes. can maybe make it easier. But anyway, I don't regret it because I knew if I could do that, I definitely could do anything. 
In fact, my dad used to say that to me because he was determined I would learn to drive on a stick shift first, right? <laughs> that was his rationale. If you can do this, you can do anything. And I'm like, yes, but I cannot think of all the things at once. Yeah, anyway. yeah. I think we, we might be in that same generation. I learned on a stick shift as well. And here is my machine quilting machine. This is what I quilt on. Beautiful. <laughs> I see a lovely space surrounding it too, which of course is absolutely ideal. Yeah, I I work in a little 12 by 14 foot room in my basement. So when I quilt, I actually swivel that machine and it's up against this adjustable height table so I can bring it down and have that for the weight of the quilt. So I make do, but boy, do I envy your beautiful sewing space and your beautiful quilting machine. Tell us about your quilting machine and your quilting business. And yes. how has that evolved into this podcast? I'm really curious about oh, the so many of your company. One of the main factors in all of these things is like a thread weaving through. So my husband, Dave, is entrepreneurial. You know, his mindset is that way. What else could we be doing? Um, you know, how, how, what other ways are there to reach people? And so he's always got a bright new idea. And Isn't I take that wonderful that you do this together. <laughs> we do. Um, but as quilting, as it became my passion, you know, even at that domestic machine, which is now eight years ago, I knew that I really enjoyed doing it. And the way I got into long arming actually is the fault of a good friend. Her name is Mary. And she had a very small, very entry level long arm that she used at home to do her own quilts. And she invited me over one afternoon to do a baby quilt on it. And I did. And I knew that you after this is what I wanted to do. Yeah. Enough, I like her machine worked beautifully for the quilt that I was doing. And in fact, would work for many, many folks who are wanting to quilt their own projects. But I knew I loved it so much that I actually wanted to create a business and do this for my day job. Mm -hmm. So I began by hunting down a used machine. And that first one was a Gamel. Yeah, it did have a stitch regulator. I think that's the only fancy dancy thing it had. It was an older machine, had some miles on it. And I did about 750 quilts on that machine. Excellent. And, you know, loved it and just absolutely got to know it. That was Lucy 1.0. I name all my machines. Those that saw me will know that. That was Lucy 1.0. I did hear that. <laughs> and eventually I upgraded to another Gamble. So that was Lucy 2.0, which I didn't have for all that long of a time, actually, about a year and a quarter. So I'll talk about the business a bit before I talk about my current machine. Because I began to find, much as I loved quilting for people, a, there's only so many hours in the day and only so much your physical body can do. Absolutely. So there's only so much quilting I can do. Mm -hmm. And B, I started getting to know a lot of quilters. And the refrain I kept hearing was, I could never do that. Yes, exactly. But you've heard that refrain too. I have. And so I kind of set out to dispel that. And the kind of quilting that I love is edge to edge. So same quilting design over the top of the whole surface of the quilt. So mm -hmm. it's not custom. It's not dictated by blocks or borders and separate things in separate areas. It's not fussy. And right. I set out to prove that this can be beautiful and that anyone who wants to do it can do it. So out of that, and of course, then a little thing called a pandemic played into it too. <laughs> yes. At home doing stuff. But out of that was born my full-fledged freehand quilting masterclass, which is this approach that shows you over 30 different designs for one thing and walks you through them step by step. But really more importantly, I think, talks you through my head process of seeing an idea and saying, now, how can I quilt that? So I see something on wallpaper or I see something on hotel carpet and I'm like, <laughs> how can I make that a continuous line, something that I can remember and do over and over again that I can quilt? And if it doesn't look quite graceful enough for me, what can I change about it? The size, the scale, the length of the petals on the flowers, whatever the thing may be. So that is a big portion of my class too, is how to think through these things, how to edit them, change them, make them fit your style and develop your own quilting designs. Because I truly do think anyone who does want to do it can. It's just like handwriting. And we all learned how to do that. Exactly. So, you, know, you start as a first grader, and then you learn, you build on it. Excellent. So that's, that's kind of how I got into the digital or online world of quilting. Um, and like I said, the pandemic definitely played into that. You know, life has pivots and corners. And that was mm -hmm. a pivot for our family. My husband's job disappeared. And so it was either, you know, make my quilting be significant 
or I had to look for another day job. And so what I chose was was quilting and I have not been sorry. Isn't that fantastic? So your your husband lost his day job and now is he working full time with you? He's not. He he now has another job. He's oh, actually he does. Um, an administrator at a church. He's got a very lovely job. Oh, um, wonderful. But he does still work with me part time. And That's because we're, we're both, let's be honest, kind of an entrepreneurial mindset, we never really turn our brains off. You probably know that feeling too. I so do. Neither I do. of us work Monday to Friday or 40 hours a week. No. I never <laughs> My husband is also in charge of his own business, so it, it's it's quite challenging, both of us running our own businesses. But that is just fantastic that you get to work together, and I see him behind the scenes in your live and unscripted uh, YouTube videos. So tell me a little bit about the YouTube videos. Well, this too was born of a desire to um, encourage people, right? And Teaching, I guess, is kind of in my blood. I'm not a teacher by training, but I did homeschool our children for a number of years. 15 oh, you're years. a teacher. <laughs> and so this idea of um, both talking through what you're doing and then if this way is not making sense, explain it this way or try yeah. showing that method. That idea of finding one way or another to explain a thing seems to come naturally to me. So you know, it was my husband's idea for sure. You should get on camera and start a YouTube channel. Camera is not my, my <laughs> definitely not that. I'm definitely an introvert, even though I don't me have any too. trouble talking once I get started. Me too. <laughs> so, so that was a stretch for me. And among many things in my business, and I'm sure you found this too, Sue, you find that you see a goal in front of yourself. There's something that you want to do, but there's things you don't know how to do whether it's the technical side of it or whether it's the writing of the blog post, you don't like writing or you have terrible spelling or whatever the obstacle may be. I feel like that's pretty common. You never get this bright idea and say, oh yeah, totally, I know how to do that. I'll just right. whip it out. You have to learn something. You have to grow a particular skill set. So for me, the skill set that really needed growing was being able to get on camera and being able to talk with ease. I was very fortunate. I had my husband behind the scenes because tech is not my strong point either, but he does all that side of the Good. YouTube channel. So, but the whole um, idea of what I'm filming is born out of this want to encourage other quilters. So I began by live streaming me working on an actual project. They're almost always client quilts. So I don't have a ton of choice of what I'm, you know, I'm limited to the quilts that are in my queue, the fabrics, mm -hmm. the colors, et cetera but I try and choose quilts that have points of interest. So either there's an interesting feature about them, um, you know, talking about why I might load sideways instead of right side up, right. or there's challenges about them like super duper bulky seams or borders that are wavy or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. And so I just stream the entire process of quilting it, talking about those things as I go. So it's not very complicated, but it seems to have really struck a chord because Quilters don't see that very often. We see a lot of edited YouTube channels, right. which are instructional, which are maybe tutorials, but don't necessarily show the good, the bad, and the ugly. And it's kind of funny, Sue, just a few weeks ago, boy, the sun just came up. I bet you saw the lighting change there. I, I have see your eyes now. It's so really <laughs> we got rid of the glare. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, just a few weeks ago, um, I did a live stream and just from the very beginning, before we got on camera already, there was a problem, you know, the quilt backing was shorter than the quilt. And it just went from there, the cameras failed, the cords fell down, the, it just thread broke, the backlash spring popped out of the bobbin casing. Like it just went on and on and on. I watched it last night. <laughs> it was well, great. <laughs> it's, it resonated with quilters. It yes. is by far and away my most viewed episode that I've ever wow, done. Wow, And the comments and the very encouraging emails that I received were so, it was such a blessing because honestly, my first reaction when I got off air was let's just scrub that off the internet and let, not let anybody know that ever happened. <laughs> um, but already people were being so responsive and saying, I'm so glad you show. And one lady even said to me, I realize this is long arming, troubleshooting, is the job description. Yes. And I think she's right about that. And and I think that applies to other things too. For example, pattern writing. You know, that is not a glamorous 
job. It's a whole bunch of trial and error and math and, and graphics design and all the things. It is problem solving. Yeah. And the pattern writer solves all those problems and then presents, ta-da, this finished product. Long arm quilting is a bit like that too. There's a whole bunch of decisions and choices that you need to make. Should I do it this way or should I do it that way? Or what would make this quilt lay flatter? And then you present, ta-da, the finished quilt and it looks like magic. Yeah. Yeah. But there's a whole process there. So I like to show that whole process. Well, I have to say that you handled the whole thing with a tremendous amount of grace and humor and your husband was right there helping you out through it all it was wonderful and i truly enjoyed it because when i am here on sewing and slippers with sue this is totally live unscripted and i just love to get to know the quilters that i found that i find in my world and i actually found you by your podcast so let's see susan you're wearing a lot of hats First of all, you're still machine quilting for others. Mm -hmm. Then you have this amazing YouTube channel with your live and unscripted quilting on a long arm. And that is just so enjoyable for me to watch because I've never actually seen the whole process before. And now you have this podcast. So tell me how this came about. I don't know if I can fully remember, although I'm sure it was Dave's idea. I'm positive I can blame that on him. And well, by what the way, came is first? Okay, is it okay if I sip at my coffee? Because I do get dry. Oh, my goodness. That's something that you don't know coffee. about me, but I am a coffee fanatic, and I have something to recommend to you. This is the Ember okay. mug. Yes. And it keeps your coffee hot all day day long. Oh boy. And it's controlled by your phone. So oh boy. I, when I saw you quilting last night, drinking your cold coffee, yeah. I said, I need to tell her about the Ember mug and you can get it on Amazon. I will look for that. You bet I will. <laughs> okay, so podcast. tell me about the podcast. I'm sure this was Dave's idea too, but we we follow because our interests lie this way we follow a number of business people who are creating online businesses i think of pat flynn i think of amy porterfield maria yep. folio some of these names might be familiar to you Jenna absolutely Cooper. people of integrity and character that are building real solid people helping businesses online so in the following of these people, I think it was probably Pat Flynn that we were listening to because he's a podcaster and yeah. he's always talking it up. It's so easy. Anybody can do it. <laughs> right? Yes. Um, but he certainly did one of his freebies that he offered was kind of a podcast checklist. So, you know, the, the basic things that you need to do, the basic equipment that you need to have, how to get started. And so we kind of took it from there. We didn't know what we were doing. That first episode you spoke about with my mom. You know, that was, that was talking your sister. My mom. It was with my yeah, sister. Right. right? Um, both named Mary. But oh. anyway, um, that that was what got our feet wet in it. And when we aired that episode, we had recorded three. That was Pat's recommendation that you have three ready to go. So yeah. we did that. But that's not very many. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, three weeks from now, I've got to have a whole nother one assembled. So as beginners do, we just started with what we knew and then gradually added to our knowledge and skill set and equipment. And so that has kind of grown. Um, I think in April, it'll be two years since I began it. And I it's weekly as a rule. I have missed a few episodes. I was uh, traveling in Canada last fall with our family. I missed, I think, the better part of two months. I was off at that point. But other than that, I've only missed a couple episodes. Fantastic. And it has been incredibly rewarding. Most of them are interviews with other crafters, mm -hmm. uh, often quilters, but sometimes not. And just asking them questions about their stories, because there really is this incredible community that we're part of. And you and I see it in our live and unscripted shows. You get to see, really, you see the same people over and over again, the same names. It is a community. It grows and expands and all of that. But it's a community I love being part of. Oh, generous people as well um, and the podcast is an opportunity to tell those people's stories and to give them a bit of a platform um i've had some great great people i could go on at length about their stories but why don't folks just go and listen for themselves <laughs> hey um having said that do you have a favorite guest or a favorite episode that you would recommend they get started with 
I think one of the maybe not very polished episodes, but most heartwarming episodes is with one common thread. Okay. And uh, this is a lady who began an organization sending, creating um, sewing skills and jobs for women in um, very poor areas of Honduras, where she lived okay. for a number of years. Okay, good. I'll look for that one. Part episode. So that's a great one to look up. And actually, we've scheduled getting together again soon. So there will oh, be an episode from her as well with follow up because she has really grown since that time. Uh, so that's a very heartwarming one. Terrific. Uh, that's a great one to start with then. Yeah. I know my I know my quilters and I know they love a good um, story with people helping people. That's, yes, that's always very with heart. Yeah, yeah, that's always a big part of our quilters' lives, isn't it? We have so much generosity, so much um, creativity that they want to share with others. So, mm -hmm. okay, good. So, so one common thread, we will look for that one. And um, I the easiest just... way, the easiest way to find the podcast is just podcast.stitchedbysusan.com. Okay. So if your if your viewers aren't necessarily familiar with listening to podcasts that will take them to, it'll give them options for where to listen. So if they okay. maybe have Spotify for their music or they have an Apple phone, it will give them all those options and be super easy. And all the episodes are listed there. Excellent. And I'm sure at stitchedbysusan.com, there will be a link to your podcast. There is also. Excellent. And to your workshops and yes. to your, ma your, I'm sorry, your master class. Yes. And then there's one more thing we have in common, and that's your membership. I have a membership also for applique I lovers. I didn't know that. I should have thought of that. Yeah. Well, we need to talk after this because we have so much in common to talk about business-wise. But I'm curious about your membership and what do you offer in the membership that's different from your master class? Well, again, as with so many of my stories, one thing is born of another and yeah. that, you know, you see a need or a, a place that you feel like needs filling or and you feel like you can you can do that. That's what formed the membership. So I've got this freehand quilting masterclass, you know, these 30 designs. But then I've got a lot of students who are like, we want more. What's or next? I come up with additional designs and I cannot forever go back and keep re-recording and expanding that masterclass. It would get really huge and really expensive. How do I share these designs? And there's a number of ways one could do that, right? You could have one-offs, you could have eBooks, you could have whatever, individual classes. But what I chose was to offer a monthly subscription-based membership. So for people that join then, there's new pieces of content added every month. And I'm curious to hear what you have in your membership, because in mine, it has to do a lot with the quilting process. So it might be a new freehand design. It might be a project that we quilt along. It might be a guest presenter. And that's kind of how I bring in some of the skills that maybe I'm not well versed in, but mm -hmm. I think my students and community would be interested in. For example, Excellent. I recently did one on um, applying a facing to a quilt instead of a binding. Yeah. Another was um, how to create a, a DIY quilting journal. So this kind of record of your ongoing works in progress and journaling what you've done on them each day and taking notes. And it's a handmade bullet journal, but it, absolutely charming. And for the lady that talked about it, you could just hear the enthusiasm in her voice. This has changed her quilting world. So it was fun mm -hmm. to be able to present that. So yeah. a lot of the people in there are past students who I invited in, you know, at a very reasonable rate, and they they have that rate for the lifetime. And so it's a way for them to get more of me. It's also a way for new people to dabble, you know, do they like my style of teaching? Do they like the type type of quilting that I do? It's a, a, a low cost way to dabble your feet in and see if that interests you. Okay, so, that's a great idea. What, I love what it. What does your membership entail, Sue? Well, our membership is a little different from that because I used to be one of those traveling teachers that went to all of the big quilt shows and set up shop at each show. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, that was exhausting. And even before COVID happened, I knew it wasn't su sustainable for the long haul. So I did the same thing in my membership. I teach classes and my students get to choose from one of two classes each month. 
and we work on our projects together in the in the workshop situation. So it's basically like going to every show that's out there and taking classes, but not having to travel and we sew in our slippers. So that is the main part of the membership, but there's libraries of all of our techniques and, and uh, workshops as well. So nice. there's a whole lot in there. So nice. uh, wonderful. So I am really curious about how you wear so many hats. How can and you continue to do customer quilts and do your podcast and your YouTube videos. Um, there's just so much in your world. And I'm really curious how you keep up that energy. And there must be a big why behind why you do this. And I know entrepreneurs always have this why behind what they do. And I'd love to hear about your inspiration. What makes you get up every morning and share your world with quilters? You're so right about the why, Sue. I think you might have to edit that statement to say every successful entrepreneur knows what the why is. <laughs> because if you if you don't have that, you absolutely would question yourself. Why am I bothering with this? You know, um, Beyond that, though, it, it's it's an ongoing process. We'll probably never be done, but it's this always balancing. So, for example, when I started um, the membership and creating content for that, I scaled back. I deliberately scaled back the quilting that I do for customers. So now, for example, okay. I don't accept any custom quilts for customers at this time for a couple of reasons. One, to free up a little bit of time. And two, because one of my whys is that I love creating quilts. And I never want to lose that love and have it become an onerous job or something I don't have time to express my creativity. Yeah. And some of my best ideas come when I'm not under a deadline, right? So creating a new design or things like that, that can't be done to a calendar, to a task list. That has to be done when you're playing and creating, at least for Absolutely. me. Absolutely. Or traveling well, or seeing things from the outside world mm -hmm. that you bring into your quilting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for me, that was so important that I keep aware of my time and that I keep some time for creation. I've actually got a quilt. And if we want to come back and talk about it in a few minutes later, we can. Yes. I've got a quilt on the floor here beside me. Oh, yeah. This next Absolutely. weekend, um, I'm a featured quilter in a city near me. And this particular project, I want something new to hang. And I've been thinking about it for months and I haven't done it. And here we are on Tuesday and I have to leave next Thursday morning. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not like I've given myself a ton of creative time, but I do want the freedom to do that. So I have, you know, done up the client quilts that I have on hand and got my commitments done. And when we're finished this show, I'm loading up that quilt and starting on it. It's a lone Good star for you. each top. So I'm just doing the quilting. But back to my whys again, you know, through this, you've heard my thread, which is I have found freedom and a skill set and a love in being able to finish my own quilts. And I want other quilters to have that. I don't want to hear that refrain anymore. I could never do that. Yes. I'd rather hear, oh, I want to learn how to do that. Yes. Because that you can do. So that's what drives me. That's what informs what reels I show on Instagram. They tend to be tip related, how to do this, why you should do that, why I chose this quilting design over that one. They tend to be that kind of thing because that's the way my mind works. And when I have a light bulb moment, I always want to share the light bulb moment. Yeah. So I'm just limited by how much time it takes to create those things. Right. You know, yes. you recognize that because you're doing the same thing. I think of the YouTube episodes, they're typically let's say two to two and a half hours long. I figure Dave and I spend at least 10 man hours on each one, even though they're not edited, even though we don't do any editing, right? Wow, yeah. That's just prep time, setup time, you know, setting up the live stream, et cetera, et cetera, the things that surround it. So that that's a lot of time. Yeah. And so it is a balancing act and it will continually be. And it's something that from time to time I stop and assess and I think, okay, do I have to let something go? If I'm accepting something new, do I have to let something go? I'm Absolutely. wearing one more hat that you maybe don't even know about. Um, I recently got a new long arm and it's a Bernina, which I oh. absolutely am falling in love with. This Excellent. just happened in January. 
And for this year and next, I am traveling for Bernina and presenting. So I'm part of their event team. So I present at trade shows and at dealerships across the country. Wow. So exciting. You know, it, it dovetails with a lot of the other things I'm doing. It's really an opportunity to get out and meet face to face so many of the quilters that I've met online Terrific. in the last couple of years. So I'm having a ton of fun doing it, but it certainly is a time commitment. So yes. I will again be evaluating, okay, can I keep all these balls in the air smoothly? Can I do them all well? Do I need to let something take a rest while I do this traveling? Sure. Not sure yeah. of that answer, quite honestly. So yeah, well, those I'll, are just be, I'll be anxiously watching to see how you handle all of these responsibilities and opportunities. What fun to be part of that Bernina team. So tell me a little bit about your Bernina machine and maybe even see, I would love to have a long arm myself. I don't do it because I know there's a, a learning curve and I don't want to I don't want to be taken away from what I truly love, which is the applique and designing quilts and making patterns. So I have some trusted machine quilters that we I work with and they are amazing. But just like you, I would love to be in control of my own quilts. Mm -hmm. So I'm really curious about um, moving from the gamel to the Bernina because all of my long arm quilters quilt on a gamel. Oh, interesting, hmm. interesting. Well, I did do my research before I made a change. And what I found before I changed already was that the different brands, and I was looking at the kind of industrial brands, you know, mm -hmm. the Anova, the Gamel, the Bernina, uh, the A1, possibly the APQS, you know, they're kind of at the top of that. Yeah. There are machines which are less dollars or smaller sizes or more lightweight frames, but I was looking for a robust machine. I knew I was because I do quite a lot of quilting. So yes. That was my first um, kind of bottom line. But within that, all those brands are a little different. They each have their own particular focus. So mm -hmm. I would not ever say that one of them is a better brand than the other one. Okay. That's but each quilter should try and learn what those features are and determine what is the best machine for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the Gamel is a very industrial machine. Um, high-end equipment and bearings and run smoothly and all those things you know the rollers and all of that which i loved but it has less uh fine and artistic capabilities i think so that's something that i was looking for in the bernina um one of the things that it does which i believe is unique in the long arm world is it uses regular sewing machine needles so oh, that means okay. a couple of things Number one, you can use the same needles you've got on hand for your sewing machine. You don't have to stock two types. Number two, you can use any specialty needle, a jeans needle, a top stitch needle. You can use a twin needle wow. in your Bernina long arm for a decorative stitch. So I'm looking forward to those artsy type things. And the Bernina is a little bit more like an oversized sewing machine. So it threads right at the front. Um, you know, that sewing machine needle, the presser foot has an up down function that you can use. So there's oh, just okay. some features that are more like a sewing machine than like the typical long arm. So they're just, it's different. Um, and I'm having a lot of fun getting to know it because it is a Bernina. It of course drives so smoothly, which mm. I absolutely adore. And it's quiet, which is nice for filming. Oh, it's quiet. That's wonderful. It's quiet. And it has really good visibility toward the needle. And that varies from machine to machine as well. So when you're putting a camera in the front and you're trying to capture a view of the quilting as you, the quilter, would see it, mm -hmm. I really liked the field of vision in the Bernina. So those were some of the features that attracted me um, to it. And so far, I'm really enjoying working with the company. They have a culture and, a, and an infrastructure that I'm really enjoying being a part of. So Excellent. that's a lot of fun. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, mm -hmm. I enjoyed watching your episode, Quilting on Your Bernina, when it was very new for you. Mm -hmm. And I I heard you talking about that episode where everything went wrong. And I said, well, that's the one for me to watch because See, I just really love not the same thing. I just love that. I love that you're honest and open and 
humble enough to admit that things go wrong. And it is so good for our quilters to see that. So I do similar things here on Sewing in Slippers. I have a guest about once a month and the other days I'm cutting my applique quilts and they're designing with me and figuring it out. How do we cut these shapes? Because I cut all of my applique with a rotary cutter. I don't know if you knew that either. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> so that is my specialty in the quilting world. That's what I do. Um, so because my business is in that area, I haven't wanted to dive into the machine quilting, but this year I decided I was going to really learn to quilt on my domestic machine. And we started doing quilt as you go projects, which was really fun to dive into this year. But That's think, a good way to approach it. Yeah. I think I'm quite ready though for that next step. And if I had a long arm machine, I'd be doing my applique on the long arm i've done a little of that only yeah. a very little and i've done it just with raw edge applique yes, so that's I'm, how i would do it as well yeah i'm not sure that it would lend itself to doing super fine work but right. it certainly is um you know you can create a certain look with it absolutely and i have done that and it's it works beautifully yeah generally I'm, i blanket stitch my applique but if i had a long arm i would be doing it right there mm -hmm, yeah mm -hmm. Um, another thing that we do a lot of, a lot is quilting first and appliqueing after. Okay. That and that's a really fun sense. technique that would work mm -hmm. as well with your edge to edge patterns. So no custom quilting, you're going right. to do an edge to edge design and then applique after. So that right. would really lend itself to, uh, people in your arena that love to do their own machine quilting and do it in yes. an easier in an easier way. So I'm and it really is true that a ton of my students um, are quilt makers in their own right. right. There's you know there is some percentage that do quilting as a business like I do, but a lot of them just want to get their own quilts done. So right. some of them will be appliqueers, some of them will be piecers, some of them will be doing art quilts. So there's this broad variety. Yes, in my circle as well. Yes. In fact, it was funny when I was watching one of your shows, um, some of the familiar names from my followers were popping up in your comments. <laughs> There's a lot of overlap there. There is. It's people the are, quilters are interested in all aspects of quilting, and I love yes. that. So, yes. well, I'm going to just check here and see if we have. It. I'm loving this uh, presentation. Um, I don't have any questions yet, but I have a lot of people watching, a lot of people saying that this is very interesting, and good morning, Susan. Good morning, both Susans. Yeah, that <laughs> makes so, it easy. Good morning for Maine. <laughs> so I, I knew you were a Canadian quilter. I didn't realize that you had moved to Washington. How long have you been in the U.S.? 12 years. Oh, okay. So this wow. is not a new thing. My husband was born and raised in Montreal. So we have nice. um, lots of family, lots of uh, connections in Canada. Yeah, my husband was born in Philadelphia. So likewise, we had, you know, one foot in either in either country. So yes, yeah. excellent, excellent. Um, fascinated. So um, one of my Facebook users says, when we w work on StreamYard, we don't get the user's name unless they give us permission to use their name. So this just says, my Facebook user says she is fascinated. So that's wonderful. Um, I have a couple more questions for you. You mentioned that you might have a quilt you wanna show us. And I see that gorgeous quilt behind you. So why don't we take a few minutes to look at your quilts, yes. uh, the one that you have to show and the one behind you, and you can tell us a little bit about it. So the one behind me is a tiny bit of an anomaly. Um, one of the one of the questions you gave me as a as a be ready for this is, <laughs> you know, have you been a, a um, pattern designer? And I did dabble in it. So this, you know, this is kind of part of my why and kind of part of streamlining maybe my business. So I'm dabbling in pattern designing because I'm thinking clearly, you know, quilters buy patterns. Maybe that's a little bit of the market share I could be in. Yeah. And I've done about six and found out pretty soon that that is not my love. I don't love it enough to do all the technical stuff that is involved. So all I've done now is enough of it to really appreciate the people who do <laughs> design patterns and publish them because it yeah. is no small feat. Anyway, you the one that you're seeing behind me is one of my designs. Oh, good. I call it Starstruck and I released it as a block of the month. And the idea being that each of the, I think you can see maybe four or five of them, it hangs right to the floor. 
Yeah. There's um, it was for nine months and there's eight different rows of stars and each row was a month and had a different skill. So and the one that you're seeing at the top there, that was using the Trirex rulers. The one that you're yeah. seeing below was tiny piecing. And some of them had to do with specific trimming, like getting really accurate, super accurate points. Some had to do with cutting things on the bias. So different skills were involved in each of those months. So it's kind of a fun sampler of different piecing designs. Well, after after publishing it as a block of the month, it kind of it didn't go very big. I don't have a very big name in pattern publishing. You know, who who knew about my pattern? I think it was six. <laughs> so it's just I made it in several different versions. And the one behind me was the highly custom version. And I did some other, you know, country floral versions and whimsical versions and things like that. Wow, I can see but the beautiful quilting in there. Thank you. That top row of stars that you're seeing with the Trirex rulers. Initially, I had pieced it with different fabrics. And all those prints, by the way, are as Allison Glass fabrics. Well, the colors weren't quite right because I'm trying to get this, you know, flow of colors through the rows of stars. So I took that row off and replaced it with what you see now, but I'm left with this long, thin row of stars, right? So it's going to be a table topper. And in fact, it is going to be the subject of this upcoming Friday's live stream. Oh, so it's good. going to be some custom quilting, but on a small scale, right? Because it's just one row of blocks. Excellent. So that's a kind of fun project. And I'm trying because, of course, my students asked, can we find the pattern? Where can we mm -hmm. get the pattern? So I'm trying to get that together in one pattern document by Friday. That's my goal. And offer of that as a PDF pattern? And offer of that as a PDF pattern. Excellent. For all Excellent. the moments. I love all the different techniques in there and um, the attention to detail. Uh, us old school quilters have definite ways of making sure everything ends up straight and flat. And that is so much better for your machine quilting. So I love that you're teaching those precision piecing techniques. Uh, we do have a question here, okay. um, a couple of different questions actually, or do you want to show us that other quilt first and then go to questions? Go for the questions. Let's do okay. it. Um, I'd love to learn about quilting because my favorite long armors have such a backlog of quilts to do. Oh, that's that's an interesting comment. It is sometimes hard to get your quilt into your favorite long armors queue. So mm -hmm. that's a really good comment, Bev. I appreciate that. Um, we have a question. Do you quilt piece quilts differently than applique quilts? In general, yes, just because the applique is often hand done and very time consuming. So you're kind of treating that with a high level of respect. So mostly, and I have honestly not quilted that many applique quilts, but I've pretty much always outlined the applique yes. and done some sort of treatment. You know, if it's a leaf or a flower, you might do a little something inside it to show it off a bit yes. and then do a background sort of behind the applique on the rest of the quilt. So that's pretty highly custom. Yes. And, you know, you're kind of thinking of it, this is how I think of it anyway, however much time you've invested in the quilt top, you're going to kind of want equivalent care to show in your quilting choice. Exactly. So for quilts that are for couch use or for college graduates, which is a lot of the kind of quilts that I do, edge to edge designs are perfect. Sometimes even on very intricate piecing, it's still perfect. But on the applique, when you've invested a lot of time into that detailed hand stitching, you know, it's kind of a raised or relief three-dimensional effect. And you yes. want to play that up with the quilting. You don't want to just flatten it out by quilting over the top of it. That's my opinion. And you're nodding. So I see that you're agreeing. <laughs> I agree with hand applique. But yes. what we do around here is all fusible rotary cut applique. Okay. So our applique is almost as fast as piecing. Then... So then my so answer, we have a lot more flexibility. Explore. You should explore and see what you like. You should do a quilt with an edge to edge and see if you like it. I have then, lots it, of them. I have yeah. lots of them. I have lots of custom quilts, but it really depends on, as you said, how much time I've invested in doing the detail work. And, mm -hmm. and is it going to be shown or is it going to be a couch quilt? Because mm -hmm. we make applique quilts that are couch quilts because they're so fast and they're so much fun to make. So One it's a little different area. Sorry. One of my absolute favorite quilting motifs, if that's the right word, is straight parallel lines. Oh, yes. Me, I love it. They're so magical because they they seem kind of boring, 
But what they do is they do not argue with your quilt, right? They don't detract. So whether mm -hmm. your quilt has a picture or whether it has intricate florals and vines or whatever, you can do those straight parallel lines and it will give texture and depth, but it doesn't interfere. It's not what catches your eye and it's the perfect foil for almost any quilt, really. Yes, I agree. So, you know, I imagine. I agree. I love it. Um, is your long arm a computerized machine or freestyle? <laughs> My current one does have the whole robotic system. That has been my recent learning curve is learning how to use that so that I can represent Bernina with at least the basics in my toolbox. Yes. So my love is still freehand quilting and it's very easy for me to go back and forth on my machine. It's just two levers that I flip to turn it off. So it's really easy to go back and forth. I still quilt far more freehand quilts than computerized, but I do have that option. Good, good. Because you have to go where your strength lies. Yeah. And you've developed all of these beautiful designs for free motion. And uh, that's where you want to concentrate most of your time. But of course, we have to be well versed so that as educators, we can see all sides of the story and help quilters find what's going to work best for them. So that's great. That's a great, that's a great answer. Way to put it. Yes, excellent. So now I'm really curious to see that second quilt. Okay, let me show you first the one that I'm going to be quilting, the vintage one. So I have to pop out of screen for oh, a second. Oh, a vintage one. Very cool. I love it. vintage quilts as well. It's really handy. Get ready for a pop of color. Good. Can you see the blue? Let me get you know the star. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get my lone stuff. star. I won't be able to get the whole thing in the camera. There's just no way. But that gives you a good view of it. Um, it is it is about a twin size quilt. It's longer than it is wide. And that's going to be the, the rest of this week's project. Is to oh, that excellent. So you pieced that yourself. I did not. It's oh, it's a vintage it's a one. Vintage quilt. I don't know okay. who pieced it. And I don't know the date of the fabrics. I would say about 50s. They look mm -hmm. like me. <laughs> I'm not an expert. I'm not. That's excellent. <laughs> I just know that I love old tops and I love finishing them and making usable, lovable quilts out of them. Oh, I am with you. I am addicted to old tops as well. I have several that I have um, bought on eBay or Facebook Marketplace, and I just can't wait to embellish them with a little bit of applique and then get them quilted and make them usable. Good idea. Yeah, that should be fun. Excellent. So, Susan, um, this... Uh, I'm going to call it a one woman show. You have a special exhibit in Washington. Tell me about that. Um, do you mean the quilt show for next weekend? Yes. Yeah. So it's in Tri Cities. Um, specifically, I think it's Kennewick. But in southern Southern Washington, there's three cities that run into each other, and they're just okay. commonly Chris, Tri -Cities. Chris Powell, if you are listening, she's going to be in your town. So get out there. <laughs> yes, it's the Tri City Quilt Guild that's putting it on. Okay. Um, so it's their annual quilt show, and I'm the featured quilter, which oh, just means when you come in the front doors, I will have a display there at the front um, and be chatting about my quilts. I'll have some of their stories there as well. And okay. they're being so, so gracious to me, the show planners, as well as the Bernina people in Tri-Cities. So in the Bernina booth, as I understand it, I'll know more when I get there, but as I understand it, they're setting up a long arm for my, at, to be at my disposal. Excellent. So throughout the two days of the show, I'm going to be doing some short demos on it. So I'm kind of getting those prepped up with, oh, probably 15 or 20 minute um, small demos that will show small techniques. One of my favorites is the way that I splice batting at the long arm that does not involve any stitching or gluing or pressing stuff onto it. Um, so I'm going to be showing that one. Uh, one is going to be like a small quilt dealing with a wonky shape and how to ease in that excess and make it lay flat, Excellent. things like that. So I'll be doing a series of these little bite-sized, um, basically live and unscripted, but tiny, really tiny. And will these be recorded and put up on your channel eventually? I don't know that they will be, except we are planning. And this is us again on our learning curve. My husband is going to come and we are going to try and air one live and unscripted episode. So it will be a whole project. But that a small would be project. really fun. That's the first thing I and thought of when you that said. With a live audience. Yeah. And see how it goes. We'll see. The background yeah. noise might be an issue, but give it a shot. That should be fun. Give I often I often do that when I'm at a quilt show. I'll do a, a, a live Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, 
and that's so much fun and people really love to see the behind the scenes at a quilt show so i think they do and it's so great if you're not able to get to a show and it's one that you're interested in it's so fun to be able to have a, a little peek at it a little glimpse at it for someone yeah. else's eyes yeah absolutely uh, patricia briggs stories are set in tri-cities well thank you i don't know patricia briggs i guess i'm gonna have to look that up so <laughs> One of the questions that I usually ask my guests is, what's on your bookshelf? What do you love to read? Or is it all how-to books and quilting books? No, it's not. Um, I, I do enjoy fiction. I love a good fiction book. I tend to read and reread authors that I really, really like. Mm -hmm. Dick Francis is one of them. Don't know if okay. any of the viewers read him. He, he wrote... Um, started probably in the 50s and wrote up until, oh, I don't know, into the 90s. Was What's his most popular book? I usually know names of books and not um, authors. To the I... Hilt might be one. The Banker might be one. Okay. Good. Bolt might be one. So he's he's English and he was, a, he was a jockey. Actually, I think he was a jockey for the Queen Mother. Oh. Way back when, like in the 50s. Wow. And then turned into a journalist and then a novelist. Um, but his, his books are, they're thrillers, but they're just... They're classically written. They're not. Um, they're not Tom Clancy action types. They're just they're good mysteries. They're great. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. I so will look those fun. up. Desmond Bagley is another favorite author. Okay. Um, also, post World War II, and a lot of his stories have to do with the war, and he's just such great character development. Yeah, I do enjoy a good novel for sure. Okay, good, good. And the Great British Baking Show. That's not a novel. That's a show. But <laughs> oh my word. I haven't watched that yet. People have been no. recommending it and I just haven't uh, gotten into it yet. It's, it's really enjoyable. It's often just my background noise, you know, when I'm right. doing something. Right. Yeah. Do you watch television or movies while you're quilting or Not listen to them? I don't actually have a TV in my sewing studio. I tend to listen to things when I'm quilting. Probably about 50-50 music and um, audible books. Yep. I do audibles and I do podcasts. Podcasts yep. too. Yeah. Yeah. So much fun. And mm -hmm. that's how I found you. Yes. <laughs> well, this is just so much fun to dive into your world of machine quilting and into your business a little bit. This is just so fascinating for me as a fellow entrepreneur and business owner and for my students and the people listening to hear about your business and what you're adding to the education of quilters. So I think that that's fascinating that you've con kind of gone the same route as I have doing mm -hmm. some um, blocks of the month, some uh, cor a, a course, and your membership. We kind of run parallel lives in that way, which is really, really fun. Um, we're getting close to 12 o'clock, so I'm trying to think if there are any questions that I had on my list that you were ready to answer that I didn't well, ask you because I was so fascinated by hearing about your business development. Not really critical, but I do have one more quilt that that your oh, listeners might enjoy. Oh, I'm it's not, sure you will. It's this all about the quilts. All the things I love, because we were just talking about books, right? Yes. So let's see if I can hold this one up in a way that you can see most of it. It's just little. I'm going to take me off again. Okay. Let's see, see if you can see far enough people can see it. That's about as good as I can get it. <laughs> Got to see a, a snippet of it. So, of course, it has books in it, which is my favorite. Quilting, obviously. It features my own black cat. It's, it's exactly his facial profile. But the really fun part about this quilt is the book titles. Uh, I'll try and get them in there so you can see them. There you go. The book titles are all salvage edges. So we as quilters know in recent years, um, fabric designers have started putting, you know, either little sayings or catchy titles or just sweet titles on their selvage edges. So I've taken to collecting those with an eye in mind for these book quilts, and I've made a few of them. Excellent. And sometimes I've even themed them. I made one for my sister-in-law, who's a longtime teacher. And a lot of hers had to do with creativity or science or a lot of fun things that have to do with school. So it's just a fun project in that way. And all those selvages are applicate on, on the long arm. Oh, fantastic. So the, the what a so wonderful quilt to share. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Susan. Hey, um, one of my, my latest um, nine month block of the month program was True Colors. 
uh, using tulip oh, and funny. fine fabric. So yeah. that's the one that I picked up immediately. Isn't that funny? Brilliant and I did, use I of did salvages. Always match the title with the with the designer of the line because sometimes their name was not clear. So you know, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> that's okay. Maybe that's not using their names in vain. But you know, sometimes <laughs> title a different different author entirely. Anyway. Oh, well, Marie oh. says it's a brilliant use of your salvages, and Beverly says what a great quilt. So everybody's loving that quilt, as well, I If do. anybody wants to make that quilt, that is one of the half dozen patterns that I've published. Fantastic. And I called it Bibliocat, another of my favorite <laughs> authors, Lillian Jackson Braun, who wrote about two Siamese cats, and one of them loved books, and she called him a Bibliocat. Oh, that's adorable. Long story. That's the title of the quilt. It's available in my Etsy shop, which is Stitched by Susan 2015. Excellent. And that pattern is available as a PDF there. Yeah. Okay, so I've had your um, website up here the whole time. So if people want to get in touch with you, what is your favorite social media network? Where will we find you most active? I would say on Instagram. Okay. And I try to be very responsive on there. I try to answer the comments, answer the messages. So. If you Excellent. want to reach out, that's a great place. Okay, yes. so Instagram, we've got your YouTube live and unscripted program. We've got your podcast, which is Measure Twice, Cut Once, love the name. And of course, your website, stitchedbysusan.com. So you'll be able to find Susan at any one of those locations. And if you are interested in learning these beautiful freehand edge to edge designs on your long arm, I am anxiously waiting for your course to become available. Is it the course that is closed or the membership or are they both open right now? The membership is always open. The course opens twice a year and it will be opening in just a few weeks time. Okay, so you, excellent. You either follow me on social media or sign up for my newsletter on my website. You'll get notification of that. But in just a few weeks, that's gonna be open again. Perfect. Well, this I was really good timing. I only do it that way so that when it's like it's a it's pre-recorded and you have access to it forever, but for the first eight weeks or so, I'm very involved, right? Good. So there's weekly Q and A's and things that I'm very involved in. So that's why I run it in sessions so that I can spend a session with my students. After that, you have it forever, you can use it forever but I'm involved those first two months. So. I love that. There's nothing better than a Q&A with the author, with, with the person who wrote uh, the book on these beautiful freehand edge to edge designs and uh, fantastic. We'll go over and check out stitchbysusan.com and find Susan out there. You're gonna love her podcast. So um, chat with me about it in our Facebook group as well. Let me know which episode of uh, Susan's podcast you love the most. I can't wait to check out the one with one common thread. That's going to be where I start when I get back. So thank you so much. Um, I have to go, but I have so enjoyed your company today. And maybe someday we'll get to be a guest on your podcast. We did talk about Absolutely. that at one time, and I think that would be so much fun. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Take care, Susan. Enjoy your day. And Live and unscripted, we are signing out from Sewing in Slippers with Sue. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.